I am Dr. Anton Bilchuk, Nadia's older brother. And I'm the younger sister, Nadia Bilchuk. We are inundated with misinformation as it relates to healthcare. And what we are trying to do with this podcast is to have a discussion based on facts, based on peer review publications, based on credible sources. So join us so that you can live long, live strong, and live healthily. Live long, live strong, <laughs> live healthy. That's our goal. I am so delighted to do this podcast with my brother, who is really a renowned cancer surgeon and researcher. And Anton, we chose today's topic around key questions, what every patient should know to ask their doctor, questions you should ask. And you really thought this would be a great topic. So tell us why. I, I think this is such an important topic because patients uh, come to see their doctor. They're not sure what the right questions are, what the difficult questions are. And what, what happens um, quite often is that patients leave the doctor's office and they don't recall the discussion. Um, and I think that to make the, your, your meeting with your doctor productive, you should prepare and you should have certain expectations of your doctor to make it worthwhile. So you tend to Google, right? You, you may Google what you think you've got. Do you go to your doctor with the questions you Googled? So that's a great way to, to start. I think you'll hear from every doctor that their worst nightmare is Dr. Google. There are, there are studies that um, come from um, Harvard Business Review that show that up to 70% of what patients look up on Google regarding their own health is incorrect. And what is most concerning is that Google, you can find just about anything on Google and it often sends patients into an absolute tailspin. So my, my recommendation to patients is Google it. Google can be helpful, but let your doctor be your Google. Um, every, it, it's amazing to me, every patient, the moment they get a diagnosis or they think they have something, will go and Google and come up with a myriad of things that really don't even apply to them. So how do you then prepare? Because one thing I've heard you say is that it's very frustrating for you as a physician that you will feel you've answered all the questions and then a patient leaves and calls the office because they are asking the very same questions. So how do we mitigate that and really become, and I think your point about becoming a more empowered patient. So I think the first thing is to think about your doctor's visit and write questions down or put them into your phone. Um, you should not feel embarrassed to ask whatever question is on your mind. What, what I often tell patients is there's no such thing as a bad question. You may get a bad answer, but there is no such thing as a bad question. And so writing things down is essential. The second thing is that every patient comes to their doctor with some level of anxiety and anxiety leads to forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. So coming with a companion, coming with um, whether it's a friend, a family member, I think is really important because when you leave that doctor's office and you can't recall a lot of the discussion You've got your, your companion that says, well, this is what the doctor said, or no, that you, you're not understanding that. So bringing someone with you, especially if it's a, not just a routine visit about flu or something that, that just requires a, a general discussion about taking anti-inflammatories or a headache pill, but something more detailed regarding your, your heart or regarding uh, diagnosis of cancer, Bring someone with you. 
You know, it's so interesting you say that because I think about a, a recent visit I had to the gastroenterologist and you are so right. Left going, what did she say? What was that again? Can't remember much. And so I think the point about taking notes or if it's serious, having somebody with you is so essential. And, and what are the questions? So let's say, you know, you're a cancer surgeon, but what are the actual questions you should be asking? What is my diagnosis in lay terms? I mean, give us like two or three essential questions. Well, I, I think the, the first question is if the doctor is talking in terms that you don't understand, which, which often happens, doctors tend to um, go off on a tangent using medical terms that are very familiar to doctors. And doctors assume that patients understand what those terms are is to challenge the doctor. I, doctor, I, I don't, I, can you please explain that to me again? I don't understand exactly what you're saying. Mm. Um, what, what, do, what, what am I, what should I expect from this? Uh, what are the next, what are the next steps? If you're telling me that I need a procedure, is that a procedure that needs to be done now? Does it, can it, can it wait? Um, I think that, you know, especially when it comes to a procedure, you never want to get a procedure done when you're not prepared. And I think it's important to, to ask the doctor, how, how do I prepare? And it could be just getting, having a, a discussion with your family. It could be getting your affairs in order. One of the really important uh, areas is if one is going to have a procedure like an operation, a simple thing like an advanced directive, mm-hmm. you know, you, it is so important. And I am absolutely shocked at how many people do not have an advanced directive. Now, now just think about that. Advanced directive, give us more detail. Right, now that, that's it. So essentially you're giving your healthcare professionals some idea of what of what you want and how you want to be treated and what happens if someone if you cannot make a decision and someone needs to make a decision for you so within an advanced directive it's it spells it out if i am unable to make a decision who who can make that decision should it be a, a sibling should it be a spouse what happens if um you know, I, I have memory loss or I am I need a breathing tube. Um, th- th- there's so many things that can happen around uh, an operation or around a procedure. And, you know, when, when, the, when the, the medical um, professionals are not clear on what your wishes are, which is really what an advanced directive is. Because you think nothing bad's ever going to happen to you, that's, right? And that's, and that's the problem. And then, you know, when something happens, and it doesn't necessarily have to be something bad, but when something happens and your goals are not clear, then it's up to other people to make decisions for you that you may not agree with. And you can... Do, you know, and getting an advanced directive is something that people can do online. They can talk to a, um, an attorney. I mean, the, the, this, is, this is something that can be done, you know, very, very simply. And again, I am just really surprised at how this is a topic that people don't like to talk about. And the last thing you want is having someone make a decision for you that you may not agree with. That's powerful. So uh, listening to your list of things, prepare, have an advanced directive. If you are just joining us, or if you're watching this on your favorite podcast platform, I'm Nadia Bilchik talking to my brother, cancer surgeon and researcher, Dr. Anton Bilchik, on how to live long, live strong, live healthy. And we're talking about essential questions to ask your doctor. And I think your advice about asking questions and not being afraid to say, I'm sorry, I don't fully understand that. Because there is still this belief that your doctor's on a pedestal. And do I have the right and permission to question them? But also, what I'm hearing from you is the tone of voice that you ask, where if somebody asks you about something and you don't understand, you can simply say, could you explain that in a little more detail? Not, I completely don't understand. And what are you talking about? It's also very reasonable to say to your doctor, 
I may have more questions. How how is the best way to communicate with you? Oh, because there's so, so many different ways to communicate. Some doctors like email. Some doctors, you know, there there are there's electronic medical record. There's something called secure chat. Do you want me to have some clear idea? Because doctors communicate in different ways, and patients get frustrated because they don't get an immediate response. But then they find out that the doctor communicates in a in a in a different way. Also, busy doctors have um, extended you know professionals that they work with, whether they be physician assistants or nurse practitioners. And you, you have to think of these people as being an extension of the doctor. So so if you have a question and you, you the physician assistant calls you back immediately, don't get frustrated that it's not the doctor talking to you because um, these physician assistants and, and nurse practitioners um, are really just an extension of your doctor and they know you know, if they have something that they're not sure of, they'll check with the doctor. But most times they can address your questions. That is actually such a nugget. And, you know, I'm thinking about where the doctor, you don't ask that question and then you call reception and they don't really know how to get you through. Whereas if you do it in the moment with your doctor, they'll say, this is my assistant and they'll give you the number of the assistant and it saves you so much time and the name of the assistant and this is where you leave a message i mean that is it sounds like an obvious thing to do but we don't do it we we, we don't do it and so without you know establishing um some guideline as to how to communicate patients get frustrated because they're not they, they they're not getting the response in a timely manner and then the doctor just happens to have a different way of communicating. Um, and so when it gets into this you know, very difficult situation where the, where the doctor is saying, I never received a secure chat, or I, didn't, so I, I don't really know what you're talking about. Yes, you called my office, but I was you know, in the operating room for eight hours. I obviously couldn't return your call. And we hear it all the time. Doctors are very hard to get hold of. The doctor takes forever to return. But, but again, um, you know, just asking that simple question when, you, when you're with your doctor, and, and it's, a doc, it's a question that doctors love to hear. You know, if I have another question, what is the best way of reaching out to you? But I still want to say, if you were giving this talk to physicians, and I know you have a lot of influence, the ability to say to physicians, remember that patients may not ask this question. So maybe as a physician to say to your patient, if you want to reach me afterwards, here is the number to call if you want to stay in touch. So it's it's two ways, right? Because we're talking to you as the patient what to ask. But I know um, I give a, a program to interventional pulmonologists, and I'm going to add this into my program. It's a program on communication. And I'm going to say to them, do you say to your patients, if you would like to reach me afterwards, if you have questions, this is the way to do it. So I think we also need to educate doctors on how to communicate better with their oh, patients. There's, 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 there's no question about that. And, uh, you know, you've just hit on a, on a nerve with me, which is about communication, because what has happened now um, with the, um, you know, electronic medical record is that there's a lot of information that needs to be put into a computer. And, and a lot of doctors feel like if they don't do it real time, then they're going to have to do it at night, at home, on the weekend. So, so, so what happens is your doctor is staring at the computer, not at you. The doctor is not communicating to the patient. They're communicating to the computer. And the patient, there's no eye contact. And the patient is so frustrated, but the doctor is just trying to survive the day. Anton, I had an experience where physician was so busy typing she did not look at me once and she kept calling me ma'am so I remember specifically saying to her very nicely and obviously I teach communication so I said to her doctor I'd be so grateful if you call me Nadia not ma'am because my name is quite clearly there and she looked up and I said also, and I said it very nicely, you have not made eye contact with me once during this visit. I said, I've come to you because I'm anxious. And she got very defensive. And she said to me, well, I've, I've got 15 patients waiting and I've got, 
And I said to her, I understand that. And then I was a little sarcastic, which maybe I shouldn't have been. I said to her, I'll tell you what, you help me with my ailment. I'll help you with your communication skills. But I will tell you the next time I saw her, she called me Nadia and she did look at me. But I think that is a whole different discussion. And when you do a podcast for physicians on how to make your patient feel seen. You know, uh, the Zulu greeting in South Africa is Sawubona, which simply means I see you. And as a physician, and I know you do this masterfully because I have spoken to many of your patients and I've had the pleasure of speaking to one of your support staff recently who says that is your gift. You make patients feel seen. I find that um, if I'm with a patient, I need to be seeing them and talking to them and not typing. Now, what what you know what a lot of busy doctors do is they'll have either a scribe or they'll have an assistant that is capturing the information and doing the, the and doing the you know the the typing or whatever needs to be put into the um, in, into the computer, and that allows me to you know have eye to eye contact, be completely focused on on the patient, listening, um, and also. I think, and, and, you know, this is another point, is that when we see patients, we prepare for the visit. There's nothing more frustrating um, to the patient when the, the patient has sent the doctor a whole lot of information beforehand, because doctor's office always, they always ask, send me this, send me that. And, you know, you, you're running around getting information from different doctors, different hospitals, different everything. And then your doctor walks in the room and says, well, why are you here? You know, versus your, your doctor has taken some time before just to, re, you know, review um, what's been sent and to go in there and say, you know, I'm going to ask you some questions. I have reviewed your chart. So I am familiar. And that immediately puts people at ease. Yes, yes, and yes. So important. And again, we're talking about questions you as a patient should ask. And I think you've been so valuable in clarifying. Can you clarify that, doctor? What are the implications? And then, and, and obviously doing it in a way that doesn't feel like you're threatening or that you're being aggressive, just in a kind way. And then I think that question of how do I communicate with you afterwards? And this is two ways. So I'm curious, when you have your doctor's visits, who is taking the notes? Um, we're very fortunate in that, we have um, physician assistants. Uh, we have a training program with um, surgical oncology uh, fellows, and but there are times that you know they're busy and and um, I'm having the conversation with the patient. There's, there's no one else in the room, and I've got to do it myself afterwards. But I will not. But I will not type and and stare at a computer and talk to a patient at the same time. And I know there are physicians who are joining us and going, that's all very well for you. You have the luxury of doing that. And I know there are many who don't. So again, as a communications trainer, my advice to those who don't is if you're typing, at least look up and make eye contact as you're typing. You know, just this simple looking at the person, because I'm going back to that visit I had where she did not look at me once not once, and then kept saying, ma'am, 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 ma'am. And it was probably the worst interaction that I've had. She improved greatly after my comments. But again, it's taking yourself off autopilot as a physician, and particularly now when you're so slammed. So let's say you do have to take notes. One can take notes and then look up. I, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that you can. Um, it's just the, it's the, it's the lack of awareness. I mean, you know, if, if a patient is sitting there feeling like they're not being heard, but they're not being listened to, then you're entitled to say to the doctor, you know, I'd like to, um, ha similar to what you asked your doctor, that's a, and, and even though the doc your, your doctor got defensive, the, the next appointment was very different. Oh, yes. And I can okay. promise you that doctor learned something from that. But I did it kindly. I, I wasn't aggressive. I just said, you know, I'd so appreciate because you made such a good point earlier. When you go to the doctor, particularly if you have something you're really concerned about, we're not talking about a routine visit, you do have a level of anxiety. Yeah. 
I've never thought about it that way. And I've never thought about writing down very carefully what the doctor says, because I don't know about you who are joining us today. Do you remember everything your physician says or your primary care physician or your health provider says after visit? Because I certainly don't. So what I've learned from you so far is take notes, preferably have someone with you who can take notes. Elizabeth Cohen, who's a CNN reporter, wrote about the empowered patient. And I think that's what you're talking about. You are empowering yourself as a patient to ask the right questions. And I also think something interesting, when you have an elderly or an older person, so you and I have a now 86-year-old mother, it was very interesting because I was recently at a doctor's visit with her in South Africa. And I thought having her daughter with her immediately the healthcare provider paid that much more attention to her than she would just some older person walking in. Oh, absolutely. And, and I tell you, on, on, on that note, um, something that um, elderly patients do, because you know, everyone has an iPhone, is to say, doctor, can I record our conversation? Uh, and do you have a problem with that? Not at all. Oh. I actually, I really, you know... Um, it's it's actually now that I think about it, it's perhaps something that that you know doctors should say to um, patients uh, or, or should should offer that to patients if they're concerned that um, that they may not be capturing the essence of the discussion. It's a very reasonable thing to say. I, I'm fine with you recording this discussion, um, and uh, you know I I think that the, the the important thing is either you know that. Doctors don't like to be recorded if they don't know they're being recorded and vice versa. But it's a very, very good um, way of, especially if you're not with a companion um, and it's a difficult discussion, just bring your cell phone and record it. Doctor, can I record this conversation? So I'm thinking of two books here. One is questions to ask your doctor. And the second one is doctor questions to ask your patients and also how to prepare for patient visits. Because you go through medical school and there's not always an element of interpersonal connection and training. And the doctors that we trust and like and want to take care of us have a so-called good bedside manner. They're not only great diagnosticians, they are also healers. Uh, we have a brother, Anton and I, Dr. Brian Bilchik, and one of his mentors was Dr. Laun, and he wrote a book called The Lost Art of Healing. And when a person comes into you, Anton, with stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four cancer, which you um, explained to us in last week's podcast, there is so much fear. There's, there's a huge amount of, of fear. And, you know, again, this gets back to two things. One um, is people trying to um, interpret their own diagnosis, and that adds to fear. The second thing, which has become a physician's nightmare, is that I'm in favor of transparency. But, you know, a lot of people now have an app. In, in our case, it's called, it's called MyChart. Right. And so every time a blood test or an x-ray is, is ordered, the results will often go to the patient before they get to the doctor. And the patients are tapping on their apps, getting these results. They'll see, you know, one thing that one point that's below normal or above normal, or they'll see the interpretation from a radiologist describing a pancreas cyst. That's, a, you know, let's talk about a pancreas cyst. I mean, most, you know, pancreas cysts are absolutely benign and they're seen, um, you know, pretty often when one gets a, a scan. Well, guess what's going to happen? You, you see pancreas cyst. Um, so you start Googling pancreas cyst. Well, that takes you into this, you know, differential diagnosis of pancreas tumors and then it's pancreas cancer. And then you start looking up the outcome and the prognosis of one of the one of the you know, the most aggressive cancers. And then you're convinced that you have pancreas cancer and your, your, your level of anxiety is through the roof. Mm -hmm. You're there to now talk about something that is totally irrelevant. And so what it's, it, it creates so much frustration for the doctor. 
Um, literally, patients are getting results real time before the doctors even have a chance to get the results. And the number of times my office or my staff or me are saying to patients, um, you know, what, you know, just please leave the interpretation to us. But that's the world we live in now. Some, um, some of these apps are giving results the moment um, they are, the, the, the moment they come out. Um, others will wait 12 hours or 24 hours. I think some, some bigger universities realize that this has created such a problem that they're, you know, they're not allowing this information to go onto the app before like 48 hours or something, you know, so it just gives the doctor a time, a chance just to look at them. Exactly. Because imagine getting this dire blood test and you haven't even had a chance to unpack it. It happens. You Patients know, get the diagnosis before the doctor does, whether it's a biopsy or an x-ray. So it's it's another example of how technology is wonderful, but it can also be harmful. I had a very interesting conversation on Friday with the sales guru, Chuck Reeves, talking about AI. And he says, with AI, you need GI. With artificial intelligence, you need genuine, genuine intelligence. And actually, before this, I went into chat GPT and said, what questions should you ask your doctor? So I'm going to ask everybody to try that because there's genuine intelligence. Go in, say, what questions should I ask my doctor? And in fact, after today's recording, because we'll now be on the internet, I think some of the nuggets you've shared may come out in your chat GPT. And then you could ask, what questions should a doctor be asking? So using genuine intelligence with artificial intelligence, but when patients are getting diagnosis before the doctor, that is counterproductive. It's counterproductive and it sends... You know, because sometimes, you, you know, you interpret it a certain way, you, you know, you panic, the doctor's out of town or the doctor's not available. And um, it just, you know, it, 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 you know, it leads to anxiety among the patient, the family, the extended family, um, second opinions. And, and that's that's something else that I think is really, you know, important is the question of, should I get a second opinion or not? Yes, I was going to ask that. How do you feel when somebody asks you that? I love that. I, I always, if someone says to me, should I get another opinion? My response is absolutely. If, you know, if you're not comfortable with that discussion or, or you know, I'm, I'm very in favor of getting second, third opinions. I think anytime a doctor, you know, gets defensive about that, that's not a doctor to see. Um, because, you know, the, again, there has to be transparency and doctors have to be comfortable enough within their decision making to say, please, you know, get a second opinion. You know, the other thing um, is that what, what, what has changed is, you know, people often think that if they travel out of town to a famous medical center, that they're going to get better care or they're going to get um more specialized care but and, and they'll, they'll land up you know traveling to another city to get a procedure or to get a treatment that they can get close to home and you know getting treatment close to home i i believe is um so important in terms of what is best for you and your family and and, that, and again that's making the assumption that you've got good care which most people do you know they often think that um good care is only at a famous you know academic university hospital but there are excellent um community hospitals that that have highly trained doctors now there are studies that are showing that a lot of the um very highly trained doctors are going to you know, smaller, you know, community hospitals and are increasing the, the level of care with outcomes that are very similar to major universities. So don't assume that um, the care in your community is worse than a major famous university. 
Wow, so much incredible information once again. As we wrap up today's Live Long, Live Strong, Live Healthy, let's just give anybody who's joined us, anybody who's listening on a podcast platform, just our key takeaways. So, and won't you just go through just bullet points? You're about to go and see a physician. What cliff notes? What do you need to do to prepare? prepare so prepare for your visit. Um, think about um, the questions you want to you want to ask. Write them down or put them into your cell phone. And don't be ashamed to ask whatever question is on your mind. Don't don't leave that doctor's office feeling like you forgot to ask something or even more important, you, you, you received an answer that you just don't understand. Challenge okay. your doctor until you understand the response. Right? It, 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 it is extremely frustrating to leave that office going, well, either I, I just don't remember or I just didn't understand what the doctor was saying. And that has certainly happened to me many, many times. And I know having this conversation with friends many times to them. And then I really like that question of find out how your doctor will communicate with you after the visit. Doctor, after the visit, if I have any questions, what is the best way? You'll save yourself time. And yes, we would love to train every physician to say after the visit, if you have any questions. But Empower yourself is what we are hoping you will do after this. So great conversation. Now, we look forward to another episode on Live Strong, Live Long and Live Healthy. We haven't quite decided on what the topic will be. So if you have any ideas or suggestions, please let us know what you want to know from a world-renowned cancer surgeon and researcher, Dr. Anton Bilchik. You can follow Anton on Instagram at Anton Bilchik. And I must say your Instagram gives great advice, guidance, nuggets, and just appreciate your desire to share your knowledge and expertise with all of us because I learn something every single day. So thank you very much, Anton. And just wishing all of you who've joined us a week of health and strength and hopefully longevity, but longevity with good quality of life. Right. So, and any thoughts for next week? Anything else you feel you really would love to unpack? What are the most commonly asked questions maybe that your patients ask? Something like that? Well, the, the, the one um, topic that, that I think is of interest to everyone is just the concept of wellness and the power of the mind. Ah, let's do that. The power of the mind and wellness will be our next topic. And I know many people relate to that. And maybe how the mind impacts the body. That would be great. So Dr. Anton Bilchik, and as we end our podcast to our happy birthday, mom. And hi, mom. <laughs> Hope you had a beautiful birthday. Hi, mom. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thanks. And look so forward to our next conversation on wellness and the mind-body connection. Join us where your podcasts are found. I'm Nadia Vilcek, NadiaSpeaks.com. Follow Anton on Instagram, Anton Vilcek.